In 1986, a bloody civil war erupted in Kwandebele and neighboring Mutsi. To make the small, poor homeland of Kwandebele viable for independence, the South African government planned to incorporate two non Ndebele areas. One of them was predominantly Pedi speaking Mutsi. But the people of Mutsi resisted both incorporation and independence. The fighting that ensued left over 150 dead, even more injured, and almost all businesses in the region destroyed. The forces against independence were an unusual mix. The Pedi speaking people of Mutsi allied with the UDF comrades and the Kwandebele royal family. It was here at the royal kraal that mass meetings were held to mobilize the people. Kwandebele was not independent. Kwandebele government had a father, and the father was Pretoria. And we knew very well that this idea was from Pretoria, because Pretoria wanted you know, to prove to the world that the homeland system were a workable option in South Africa. We're trying to prove liberation movements wrong. Fighting for independence was the Kwandebele government, who had a secret weapon, a vigilante gang called Mbokodo, which means the grinding stone. At Imbokoro's head were the chief minister of Kwandebele, S.S. Kosana, and minister of the interior, Pete Ntuli. They were formed to, to, to persuade the, the Mutsi, so to speak, in people, to agree to be part of the Kwandebele, which the Mutsi people re re rejected and resisted until they won it. They were very fierce guys. They, they, we, when they go and attack, they used to have a kind of a paint. They painted themselves white. Are they, whether they make a cross because you couldn't go closer to them, I was very scared of them. From late 1985, Mbokodo conducted a series of mass raids against the people of Mutsi and their Ndebele allies. In December 1985, 67-year-old Musi Matebe was one of those taken to this hall and tortured. They said they were going to give me 28 lashes. It was not like that. One was standing this side, the other was standing on the other side. I was just in the middle of the table. When the other one shambled me, the other one would shambled me. And they were tired by assaulting me. But it was in 1986 that the Imbokodo reign of terror really took hold. In one of the most notorious cases of human rights violations in this area, between 200 and 360 Mutsi residents were abducted and again brought to the Siabuswa Hall. They were subjected to 36 hours of torture and ritual humiliation. They put soap and they took a hose pipe and they poured water. Then in that, in that foam, they put us there in that foam and they came with, with shambocks and we were beaten. Solomon Rashlangu was one of the many UDF comrades who got a taste of Imbokoro's venom. He too was taken to the Siabuswa Hall and tortured. At about uh, 6 p.m. late, they came, came um, uh, the chief minister of that time, Mr. S.S. Kwasana. Then he asked me several questions. Then he said to me, uh, Mr. Mahlangu, if you are here, if you are going to tell those people the honest truth, then you must know that maybe sometimes you can be safe. But if you are not going to tell them the truth, know very well that you are not going home, you are going to be killed. And then by that time, is then thereafter I was started to be beaten by those uh, Mbogoto Youth Brigade. But firstly, I have been started to be punched by this man whom I call, he's called Mapena. He was one of the, the bodyguard of the ministers, uh, Mr. Pitintuli. 
And then I was beaten by those people and they were having pickaxes, some of them were having guns, some of them were wearing shambox, they were having many things and some of the members of the vigilant group at the same time they were wearing ballot gloves uh, because I cannot see them clearly. But those whom I can see them clearly, it was John Matangwe and this one, uh, Mr. Mapene, and some of their children who were there inside. Uh, wherever Mbogote is, you will always see the Casper behind them. You'll always see the van behind them. They were never really moving alone unless they were, they were going at night when people were not. But in daylight, they would never move alone. And uh, that's why I, I, I agree with all those who are saying Mbogoto and the police were working uh, hand in glove. They never really worked in isolation. The comrades retaliated and Kwan de Bele burned. Chris van Niekerk was then in charge of the Kwan de Bele police. He was opposed to independence and to the Kwan de Bele government's use of the Mokoro to terrorize the local people. The Kwan de Bele government was actually my, 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 my boss, so I had to kind of obey them, etc. But uh, regarding the Mokoro, I couldn't do it. So. On several occasions, I, I went to them and I warned them not to use the Mokota to set up roadblocks to attack people. In Pretoria, Mbokoro's rampage was becoming a headache and its leader, Pete Ntuli, an embarrassment. Pete Ntuli was originally placed there by the government to become the next chief minister. However, he went out of control. And it was clear that the government could not keep him, detain him in terms of the act because that he would have had a bad influence on the other members of the government. And hence, Pitintuli became a poison ivy for the South African government. And the only way out was to get rid of him. With Pete and Tuli's assassination, things were spinning out of control for the Kwan de Bele government. They fired for Nikirk and replaced him with this man. Brigadier Herzog Glerum was prepared to do what the cabinet asked of him. Glerum, of course, came here and made all of Mbokoto special constables so they could do, proceed with their activities legally under the flag of the police. I am here to steer to the trust between the RSA regering and the Konebelle regering to heal. Eight days after Laram's arrival, the Speaker of the Kwandebelle Legislative Assembly announced that independence was being thrown into the deep ocean. The battle was lost, but the war was not over. The Kwan de Bele government only abandoned their dream in 1988. 